My name is Denise Amaranta. I am an enrollment counselor. I work for Rice Point on behalf of George Mason University. We have here Director Jen Baldo. I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you our agenda. There'll be some housekeeping items I'll go over and then I'll go ahead and transition it over to our director, Mr. Baldo. So on the agenda today, you will get to meet the presenter, which will be, well, I'm presenting and so is Mr. Baldo. Um, he's going to give, your, give himself some information about himself. He's gonna go over the driving forces, why you should choose Mason's data analytics engineering program. Um, he's gonna discuss the master's in data analytics engineering, the curriculum details. He'll touch base on the online classroom curriculum. Um, I'll go through the admissions requirements and then towards the end, we'll have an opportunity for Q and A. Um, before I go ahead and transition over to Director Baldo, did wanna give some housekeeping items. So how to participate for chat instructions in your controls at the bottom window, you can click chat for the chat window to appear and type your message. You can also select who would you like to send the message to by clicking on the drop down next to two. You may also raise your hand in your webinar controls. Then I will be, I will be notified that your hand is raised. If you're prompted to speak, you may then unmute yourself. If you have any questions, click Q&A in your webinar controls to get access to see the Q&A window. Type your question in the text box to ask a question. So please try and hold them off towards the end unless there is something that you need answered at the moment. I will go ahead and let the director know and he will answer that. Without further ado, the director of the Data Analytics and Engineering Program is Mr. James Baldo, and here's a little bit of information about him. I will go ahead and transition it over to him so he can introduce himself. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Hopefully everybody can hear me well. I'll, um, I'll move up a little bit here. Um, every once in a while, this, this mic on my, on my laptop gets a little sensitive. Um, so, so hi, I'm, I'm Jim Baldo. I'm the director of the Data Analytics Engineering Program at George Mason University. And in this slide here, I'll just give you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was away for two years. I was on sabbatical over at the Department of Homeland Security, where I had this wonderful opportunity to practice every single day as a data analytics engineer, uh, doing the same things that we prepare our students for. Um, I spent about uh, 40 years in industry. Uh, full time, and uh, of those 20, 20, about 19 of those years, I was an adjunct professor here at George Mason University. Um, one of the reasons why I liked uh, being an adjunct was I was able to um, uh, teach, I was able to work with students, and uh, I learned more from students than they learned from me. So uh, it's always uh, um, really great to work with uh, graduate students who are working full time. I get to hear all these uh, wonderful things that they're doing and these interesting projects that they're working on. Uh, I then, around the fall of 2018, I decided to make a switch. Uh, I switched to full-time. Uh, full I became a director of the Data Analytics Engineering Program here at George Mason University, and I was then became part-time in industry. So I still work in industry about 10 to 15 hours a week. Uh, the Dean of the College of Engineering uh, encourages me to do that. And so uh, I do that a, a little rough in the sense that you know, I spend, you know, a 40 plus hour week, uh, normally close to 50, but I really enjoy what I'm doing and uh, being able to practice and then come back to the, this program here and work with all the wonderful faculty that we have is just really, really great. Um, so uh, this program is really set up for folks like who are working. And so I wanted to give you that background about me because of the first two degrees that I got in chemistry, uh, I was a full-time student. Uh, when I was in uh, graduate school, uh, I had a uh, stipend. Uh, so um, in those days, I'm, I'm a lot older than anybody here. Um, education was a lot um, more economic. Um, and so I had a full a full stipend and teaching assistantship. So I really didn't have to pay for much of my undergraduate or my my first graduate degree. Then I worked full time 
on my second master's in computer engineering and my PhD. I worked uh, here in the Washington DC area for, uh, I worked in the government sector, uh, worked at some FFRDCs. And then again, um, it was full time. I had a family and all those sorts of responsibilities. So this program here is um, very much like what I went through. Um, you know, I would work during the day and then come home at night and I had to sort of um, manage my time. So I just wanted to, to throw that out. Uh, I've been through that sort of, the sort of thing that you're gonna go through and um, it's very doable, very, very doable. So um, why don't we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so this program started uh, around the fall, it started in the fall of 2014. So we've been, this fall will be 10 years. Uh, I think we actually celebrated our 10 year anniversary at the end of last semester in the spring. So it could have been the spring. I can't, I, I get those confused in the spring of 2014. Uh, the program, so, so in a university you have departments and then you have programs. Uh, some programs are attached to a department. This program here is a multidisciplinary program and uh, it is in the, in the College of Engineering, which has two schools, the, the School of Engineering and the School of Computer Science. <clears throat> and this is a multidisciplinary program. And the Dean Ball, who's still the dean, he started, he, he was the one who encouraged the, the, this program be initiated. He was seeing a lot of requests across all of his departments in engineering for uh, data analytics, not data science, but data analytics. And so he said, hey, we need to get a program in place. I want it to be multidisciplinary. No department will own it. It'll be independent and the director will report directly to me. So that's how this program got started. And it was due to Dean Ball's uh, belief and, um, and pushes very hard and is very supportive of keeping uh, this program to, to go through all these porous walls with the, with the school, the two schools and, the, and their departments. We also go outside of the College of Engineering to the School of Business, the College of Science, um, our College of Health and Policy. Um, we also go into the Department of Language. We have a linguistics component as well. So um, we that is a really big driving force for us to be multidisciplinary. Okay, so that was sort of why we were created. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing in industry today. Um, first and foremost, diversity is a very, very important uh, dimension to analytics. And the reason being this program was set up on four pillars, uh, computer science, statistics, um, general engineering and domains. And so the computer science and statistics just makes a lot of sense for data analytics. Um, there's a lot of, of tools and, and concepts and theories that come from both statistics and, and computer science um, that are quintessential to have to, to performing analytics. The general engineering aspects, because we are uh, data analytics engineers, provides the necessary things that you need from an engineering perspective, from a tooling perspective, risk management. So we embed those sort of things into the courses that we're, that we're teaching. And then the problem domains allow us to be generalists. So I am a general data analytics. So I'm a data analytics engineer, I'm a generalist. So the way I practice is that I come in on a team and that's how we prepare our, our graduates from this program here to go off and work on across different problem spaces, finance, healthcare, um, uh, defense, um, uh, oil industry. Uh, we cut across every major domain, uh, all the problem spaces that you can think of. And so normally we come in, we work with subject matter experts. Uh, we apply our knowledge and our skills and from a teaming perspective to solve problems, to produce analytics. Uh, you know, sort of to provide that sort of insights and foresights um, that uh, our customer, that a customer or a client or an organization would be looking for. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about technology, engineering, and science today 
is how quickly technology is changing. So when I left for my sabbatical to the Department of Homeland Security two years ago in May of 2022, um, large language models were just coming on the, the landscape, becoming very, very noticeable. Everybody was talking about them. And um, they just sort of, you know, they had been around for a while. Uh, you could talk about, um, you, could, you could see them on the landscape, but all of a sudden they became very, very popular. Um, there were technological enablers that allowed them to, to become really, really uh, uh, powerful. Uh, and of course, they, people uh, took, you know, took to heart, started to use them. Um, and of course, as in any type of new technology, one begins to run into sorts of problems, limitations, uh, but they're still there and they're still going to be there for a long period of time. And then what we were seeing um, was a change in data, the way people were viewing data. And so one of the things that we're seeing right now is that a lot of folks doing analytics were looking at things like data sets. Okay, hey, I, I want a data set. And of course, all the things that, all the dimensional, the quality, the observability, um, uh, sparsity and things like that, that you have to deal with when you have uh, large data sets. Uh, people are now starting to look at this in terms of two, two areas. One is data products. Uh, so the notion of a data set is starting to go away. And then, um, this concept of a data mesh and, and the other concept is of a, of a data fabric are coming on where specific domains take ownership of your data. So this has been rather rapid um, and very quick and people are trying to figure out how to deal with all this. Some companies, you know, got C-level uh, folks coming in, in, you know, CEOs coming in saying, we're gonna do this. We're going to embed AI into all of our analytics. Um, and, and, and speaking of that, then we started to see uh, agentic or agent-based systems come on. And the agent-based, the, the agents were beginning to use uh, the data mesh. Um, they were beginning to use the LLMs. Um, so that technology is coming on and that will take over. We'll start to see some of the analytics that we're dealing with today will be the agents, will be using agents to, to um, implement to design our analytics with. And so the question comes about, you know, why do you need a program like this? Or are we all gonna lose our jobs and, and artificial intelligence is gonna take over? Um, I've been around for a long time. I've seen huge disruptive technologies come on the landscape. And this one's no different than anything else. It is pretty powerful, no question about that. But usually it's an enabler. It enables us to do our work um, enables us to work faster um, by working smarter and allows us to work more intelligently so we can solve more problems. And I think there's going to be a huge unknown number of new types of roles for data analytics um, that's going to that's going to come about. Um, there will be some changes as the way we do work, no question about that. But this is one of the things that we try to do in this program is to give you the tools uh, to go forward with. Let me go to the next slide, please. Okay, so I do wanna say something. This is a really, really nice slide. Um, we are being noticed. Um, uh, there's a number of, of, of um, organizations, institutions that come around and, and evaluate and assess programs. Uh, we're showing up more and more. Um, we have great faculty here. Um, it is second to none, uh, and, and our folks are doing some exceptional research um, across the board in, in engineering. And as I said, we go outside of the engineering school, um, out of the engineering college. We go outside of that for the business, uh, and we have some. We we um, we have a very very famous center here, the the, the Shar Center, that we've been doing some work with them. Um, and so we are embedded uh, with all of these folks that are doing some excellent work. You, you know, George Mason faculty, uh, they get quoted in the news. You'll see them on NPR. You'll be, you know, they'll be interviewed on NPR and things like that. So uh, 
there's there's a lot of um, of uh, really really good people here, and again, um, I think that is a really powerful um, um, component of our program is to have access to all these really really fine people. Okay, uh, in the bottom right hand quadrant here, um, there is the online graduate certificate option, and uh, I just want to say a few words about that. Um, it's a uh, four course option and um, it's there. We have some folks that come back. Um, they're not really interested in getting the master's and they just want to take some courses. They get the certificate. It's helpful for the work that they're doing. Sometimes they're working on projects where they need to have a certificate in order to work on a project. And so this is, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is an enabler for them, but um, many of our folks who get the certificate, uh, they, they get, bit by the bug here they get they get excited about what they're seeing and then they continue to go on to the master's so if you do get the certificate all those courses count and you can go on further but um it is it is a nice option to have if you just want to get you know take those four courses and get the certificate uh the beauty of this certificate here versus other certificates that may come like from an online and i'm not I, and i think other online uh certificates uh from other um uh, places are, are equally as good, but the, the thing here is that it's branded. This is a, uh, George Mason is known, it's it's a branded name. And so it's nice to have that certificate with George Mason University on it. Um, so um, one other thing I, I wanna say that is unique about our program is that we produce the blended data analytics engineer. So you've heard this term, the data scientist, um, the data engineer, the data architect, the machine learning engineer, you go on and on. We do everything we can. And, I, and when I took over the program, uh, I did put this emphasis on these particular roles that we were seeing and skill sets that industry was asking for. And we looked at a lot of job recs. We were constantly you know, surfing the web and looking for job recs, what people were looking for in skill sets, because it's important for us to provide industry, uh, fulfill their needs. At the same time, uh, we're not short-sighted. Uh, we are are looking in for in the long down that down that path as far as we can. So we want to give people skills so that we know folks need to be lifelong learners, and that's part of our program. We, we made the program very very flexible. We put high quality courses in there with our high quality faculty, and then. We wanted to make sure that once you leave us, and one of the things that I'm doing now is we're trying to establish um, some, some programs that people can come back and we can provide things like, for example, I mentioned these agent-based systems and specifically for analytics that we might be able to offer some, some courses uh, for our alumni. Our alumni are key, okay? So we, we only have you for a short period of time in this degree program. Uh, you know, two, maybe three years at the most in, 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 in these cases. Uh, we get a chance to know you, but then you take off after you get your degree, rightfully so. But we do want to bring you back in. And that's one of the things that we're trying to establish right now. So I think that's what makes our program uh, unique in the sense that we are generalist. We provide that general degree, which there's, I, we've yet to find a program that offers that, that general data analytics engineer, okay? Um, there's programs that offer specializations like in business and finance, healthcare, and those are good. There's no question about that. But we were we were trying to build the general the general data analytics engineer um, with an emphasis on engineer. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, a little bit about the course the, the structure of the program. Uh, these core courses that you see here, there's five of them. And uh, there's four foundational courses. Um, and just let me say a little bit about each one. The AIT 580 is really our data course. That's the one that talks about that, that addresses data. What is it? Uh, uh, where, it, how is data used? Um, and equally as important, what is the value of data? And that's something that has become very, very important when you start talking about data products is that you are under constant pressure as a practicing data analyst engineer to produce value. Um, and then the CS504, which is our data management, and we, 
We do introduce machine learning and data mining in that course as well. That sort of is the active part of data. Um, that data, the relational databases, data warehouses are still important, but on that landscape, we are seeing things like data lake houses, data mesh, data mesh, data fabric. Uh, I'm updating that course as we speak right now. So when that course is offered in the, the fall of this year, uh, I'll have a chance to embed some of those newer concepts in uh, that I that I briefly just touched on this evening here. The OR 531 is, is the modeling course. And what it does is it tries to give our students the, the core modeling capabilities. Uh, they understand how to do modeling and do it in the context of analytics. Um, and then the STATS 515 is a, it's sort of a, a combination of statistics machine learning and visualization. Um, the course was originally set up uh, by Dr. Dan Carr and uh, he was a world-class expert in visualization. Um, and so that, that course really, he's since retired, uh, but that course uh, you know, tries to address that aspect of visualization because to get insights or foresights when you're projecting this back out to end users, people who are consumers, uh, you know, that consumable layer that sits out there and on, the, on your data platforms, um, they're consuming a product, the visualization, uh, tables clearly are visualization, graphs, charts, um, sometimes a three-dimensional rendering. And, and lo and behold, we are already seeing virtual headsets, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, being mixed into the, into the visualization area. So those are the four core. So that is the found that is a foundation that sits on top of this these these knowledge pillars of computer science, um, statistics, um, engineering, and domains. So we we put those foundations on top of those pillars. This last course, it's a core course that you have to take, is the data analytics project, and this is sort of it's a shining star of our program. Um, when I came on board in 2018, uh, this was really a, a very, very important uh, and very, very interesting and exciting course to take. It's usually the last course that you take. Uh, uh, so the uh, online program, which I'll mention a little bit later, is eight week, eight week sessions. This one is 15. You, this is the one you have to take. It's 15 weeks. The full semester. It's a full semester rather than a session, and it is really. Um, an adrenaline rush. We get, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll pair up, you'll work in a team of four to, four to six students, and then you will um, work with an industry partner or an academic partner. Um, we've had students um, have capstone projects with their employers, you know, employers willing to, to sponsor the project. Uh, and when I say sponsor, it doesn't mean they, they don't pay anything for this. It's just that they have to provide us with a subject matter expert. Um, they, they, they attend the weekly sprints. It's, it's uh, agile, scrum-based. Um, so it's really, really, uh, I wish we could have, uh, you know, like an internship for all of you, keep you here for three years, and one of those years is an internship. But we just haven't gotten there yet uh, to do that. This last course, and I'll talk about electives on the next slide. We do have an independent research course. This is a DANN 698. You can take it up to three hours. And it has to be with a faculty member and you'll write a proposal and um, it'll be an eight week course. I've sponsored a number, I've been a faculty member for several of these courses. Um, just recently, just before I went on sabbatical, a student came to me, wanted to do some advanced statistics. So uh, we went ahead and, and uh, looked at some advanced statistics, got a data set from the University of Michigan. We did some, uh, some social science data analytics. Uh, it was actually a, a really, really good little project. And, and one of the things he wanted to do was go in and verify and validate uh, some existing findings and results that came from the University of Michigan, the study, the social science study that uh, they performed. Um, so anyways, that's, that's open to you as well as one of your five electives. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please, Denise? Thank you. So um, our electives, as I said, we come uh, from a multidisciplinary program. So, so IST is our information science and technology department, which is in the College of, uh, of Computing. Um, they have probably the most of the, of the elective courses that they offer, because all of our elective courses have to be um, asynchronous. 
And so these courses have been packaged so that they're asynchronous, so that we can offer them to, to our online folks here. Um, the uh, CR is our Systems Engineering and Operations Research Department. Uh, they have packaged uh, four uh, courses for us, so you can you can pick from those if you're interested in some systems engineering work. The uh, electrical engineering has two courses right now, um, and actually those two courses were put together by uh, Bob Osgood, who was the original director of the DNA program. In fact, he was the fellow who reached out to hire me. Um, uh, so Bob's a really good guy, and he put together those two courses when I asked him to do that. Um, and then the GBUS come from our business school. Uh, so you can actually take some uh, analytics courses that are oriented towards the, the, the college of the, the business college. So um, so right now those that's what we got packaged uh, each year um, or each semester. We try to add more to those. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if by the time you leave, we've added you know, some more to this. Uh, but we continue uh, putting courses online um, does take a lot of effort. It's uh, especially when they're they're uh, asynchronous, and so um, you really learn how to teach a course when you have to do it. Because I taught the CS five hundred course for a number of years um, in the theater in a classroom, and it's totally different when I had to put it together for the online. But the beauty of the online is, I think these are actually I do think the online courses come off much much better. Um, they're they're better packaged. Uh, for the student, uh, for I shouldn't say for a student. You folks are working professionals. Uh, for the for the working professional and the way they are packaged and, and to help you learn. Um, so that's there. And again, um, you have four you have four foundation courses and then the capstone. So those are the five core courses. Then from there, you have this menu of, of electives that you can take and you and you get five. Now you could substitute one of the five with independent research if you're so interested in doing that. Okay, Denise, next slide, please. Okay, um, I wanna say just a little bit about the online learning. I've said a few things so far, but I'm just gonna summarize it to give you a little bit of a taste of it. Um, number one, these are asynchronous, so it is, they're set up so that you, when the semester, the session starts, they're, they're based on, with the exception of the capstone, they're eight week sessions. So there's eight modules. Um, that is standard, you have the eight modules. Normally in the module, you will have uh, lecture content. Uh, there could be some video, it, it could be just soundtrack or it could just be slides. Uh, usually it's a mix of those depending on the instructor who built the course. Uh, you normally in a module and in modules you can think of as, as the one week. So you start on Sunday Sunday evening and you go to the next Sunday and that's that's the time frame of a module. So you have your your lecture content, your lecture content. you have possibly knowledge tests. and what I mean by that is in between you know you have a short video or a short soundtrack. Um, uh, it depends on the instructor in the course. And then there might be a knowledge test, hey, you know, test your knowledge. Um, there may be some actual quizzes that you have to take. Usually there's some assignments. Uh, some of these courses are set up where they have projects. Um, and some have exams, okay. Um, and so all of that is run, will be run online in a platform, in a learning platform called Canvas. We have just made this transition from Blackboard to Canvas. So um, uh, when you, so please, if there are any problems, please get back to us right away. Uh, but so far, Canvas is a very stable platform. Um, in fact, a lot of my colleagues who have used it in the past say it's much easier to use and much friendlier and better for the students uh, than Blackboard. I can't comment on that. I don't have a lot of experience with Canvas, uh, but but we have experts um, from RisePoint or from our online uh, folks that that take care of, of all that for us. Um, but my guidance to you folks on the online, and everybody learns differently, but with an online course, especially when you're working, I, I recommend that you allocate some time during the week, you know, maybe a couple of hours in the evening, or if you can afford it some evenings, more hours um, to, to focus in 
on the module. Okay, so maybe in the beginning, you want to get through the content, the lecture content. Uh, you, you may want to take a quiz or two, if it depends. You might have one quiz that week, you might have two or three, you know, take your, take your quizzes, uh, get, make sure you're working on your assignments. Um, and the reason that I say that is because I always encourage students not to wait until the weekend. It's tempting to do that. You say, hey, I got, you know, I'll spend eight hours on Saturday as a 16 hour. Normally you need to spend a good uh, 15 hours to 20 hours a week on a course, especially an eight hour course. These are condensed courses. Normally they're, they're across a 15 week time period. So you don't want to sort of find yourself you know, waiting till the weekend to do this. And secondly, if you run into some problems like with an assignment or something, don't beat your head against the wall. Uh, make sure that we have discussion boards. You can use the discussion board to go off and talk with some of your other students. You know, hey, I'm having a little bit of problem with this particular assignment. Uh, uh, you know, not saying to have them give you the answer. You don't want to do that, no, but maybe somebody might be willing to give you a hint or something like that. And, and clearly, you can reach out to your instructor. Instructors, although uh, it's not synchronous where we're going to have you meet one, one night, usually a graduate class on campus, you're going to meet, you're going to be there for three and a half hours for one night on campus, uh, and you'll see the instructor. But um, you can always reach out to the instructor, uh, you know, send an email. Um, and say, hey, I need, I need to talk to you about that. So I, I normally recommend when I teach like CS504 is if you're having a problem with a particular assignment, you know, spend some time on it, 15, 20 minutes, but if you're still not making any headway, um, start to reach out for help, okay? There's nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, that's why you're in the university is to, is to get assistance and, and, and help and how to, how to solve a particular problem. Okay, so that's that's my big my big recommendation there. Um, so that is where I see sometimes I see students run into that problem where they sort of wait until the last minute because sometimes it might be hard, especially if everybody waits till the weekend. Your instructor gets inundated with with questions um, that makes it pretty difficult. And so you know you're, there's going to be deadlines. We need to get your assignments in, your quizzes completed, and things like that. So try to, you know, set that rhythm up for yourself uh, if you can. Okay, uh, with that, I think the next slide, Denise, is um, yes. how to apply. Thank I'll you. turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Baldo. So I will go ahead and walk you through the admissions process. So the first requirement is that you have a bachelor's degree with a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. You will need prerequisite courses. So one calculus course and one statistics course and computer programming course. Those are the three prerequisite courses needed along with that bachelor's degree and a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. We'll also need all of your official transcripts for any undergrad or graduate schools you have attended. Um, if you are a GMU alumni, we will pull those for you. If you have unofficial transcripts, we will accept those in order to review and see if accepted. But once accepted, we will need all of your official transcripts. We'll also need one letter of recommendation and we'll need a personal statement um, we usually provide you with like the prompt for the personal statement, but just to give you an idea, it should consist anywhere from 750 to 1000 words. You normally would just touch on um, some of your personal qualities, your experience, your background, your reason for choosing this particular program, your reason for choosing George Mason and anything else that you would like to provide on there. Um, all applications are viewed by faculty. It's not just like overlooked anything. Everything is important. Um, we are here to support you every step of the way. If you have questions with the application, if you need assistance with submitting the application, there's always someone that is available to help you. Um, I will go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is going to just provide you the phone number, an email address and a website. And there's also a barcode if you would like to go ahead and apply now. 
I will leave that up there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and I will go ahead and read those off for the director, Baldale. Yeah, so don't be, don't be shy. Feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm more than happy to, to answer any question that you have here about the program. You guys can go ahead, either put it in the chat or you can put it in the Q&A and I will go ahead and ask Director Baldo your questions. Director Baldo, one of the questions is, is there a limit on classes that may make it difficult to choose the classes that you want? Um, so I think this question is referring to um, I've taken my my core courses, the, the four core courses that are there are the four foundation courses. And then you want to take an elective, the next session. And I think the, is, and I want to make sure I understand the question. Is it possible that that course I want to take is not going to be offered? Is that the, the question? Yes. So is there a limit on classes? How, how many students per class? Oh, uh, well, Okay, good question. Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, so what we do at, at George Mason is that we the, we set limits. Usually, I think it's around 25. The instructor, because we like to keep those classes small so that the instructor doesn't get overwhelmed or that we have to bring a TA in and you're dealing with the TA rather than the instructor. So normally they're 25. Sometimes we, the instructor is asked if they can add some folks because it's a very popular class and they might boost it up to 30. But what we normally try to do is if we, if like, for example, Denise finds out the, some, the session before this course is going to be offered that she has 40 people in the online program that want to take a particular course, we'll work with the department who owns that course to maybe open up another section. But we try to keep them around 25, uh, these courses here for the online. Mm -hmm. And that again is just to make it so that you have access to that instructor. Uh, you can do a one-on-one -on -one with that instructor. Um, the, you know, some, unfortunately some of the on-campus courses like with our CS504, you might have a hundred or 150 students in the class and then you got one instructor but you may not have it you may not get much access to the instructor you might be having to deal with the ta the teaching assistant i hope that answers the question thank you director baldo one of the other questions are you only ever taking one class at a time or some semesters do you take multiple eight week courses okay great question when i when we first started the online program um, we spent some time with uh, professionals who had run online programs for many, many years. And when they assess, and there's various types of uh, metrics that people use for a condensed eight week program. And in other words, we, we can press these programs from 15 weeks down at the time it was seven and a half, but now it's eight. We would only let people in the online program take one course at a time. Now, that rule is somewhat still in place, but we have situations where if somebody has now taken some time off from work uh, or they've decided to just, uh, in some cases, we've had some people where they've decided to um, um, terminate their, their position because they want to go to school full time. It's a career change. Um, and so we will talk to the online advisor. If it looks like you have enough, if we feel comfortable, because the thing is we don't want you to sign up for a course, go, go four weeks into the semester and then lose your money where you, you know, it's too much for you and you have to drop it. So you work with the online advisor um, and we try to assess whether you'll have enough time to do it. And so we're starting to allow that to go on. Working full-time, uh, taking two of these courses is, is a lot on your plate. It's tough. It's really tough. Because remember, these courses were, uh, the con this content goes, is set up for a 15-week on-campus on course. 
and condensing it to eight, you got to really move. It's it's a, it's a lot of work. You got to go through all the content. You got to take the quizzes, the homework. There may be, you know, some of them have a midterm and a final, um, you know, so you want to be, you want to do well. I mean, you, you want to do well in the program. So we try to work with you to make sure that we understand and you understand that you'll have enough time uh, to take two in one session. I hope, uh, and I'm not trying to scare anybody away uh, from trying to do that. Of course, if you, you feel like you're in a situation where you know you, you wanna try to accelerate and go through the program, we're more than willing to work with you, but at the same time, we don't want you to, to fail either. Uh, we want you to be an alumni. Definitely want you to be an alumni. We want you to to uh, get through our program. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Are there any co-op opportunities available within the program? With the online program, um, I don't um, I haven't worked that through yet with the online program. So when you say co-op, like sort of like an internship. Um, just say yes or no. Is that which is is that similar to what you're talking about here, like an internship? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the the internships, I think we could work something out on that. But those internships, um, we don't have. You don't get credit for that. So like I have, I'm running the internship program for the data analytics program, on the on ground program this summer. I have probably like 15 students in it. Uh, some of the students are getting, they, they get zero credit for it, but, but they get the, they get this experience that you're looking for. So some of them, um, they're full-time students. There some of them are, I got two in Texas. I got one out in California. I got another one in Idaho, one up in New Jersey, a couple in the, in the Virginia, Maryland, um, uh, DC area. Um, some work remote, um, you know, they don't have to go online, but, but it's zero credit. Um, but it's, it, you know, it goes down your record that you have the internship. So, uh, what I find most people using those four in our program, um, and it's a good thing to do that, you know, that you put that down on your resume, uh, that, you know, you had this experience working on an internship here. Yeah. That's what we have to offer at the moment. Um, and I'll work with, uh, the advisor here to see if we could extend that into the online program as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Baldo. There's no more questions. I don't know if you have any takeaways, anything you want to leave the students with before we go ahead and end our session for tonight. Yeah, so on a, on a final note, um, one of the things that, that I firmly believe in is that when you enter a graduate program like this one, regardless of what the graduate program is, um, you're... At, at this level, at this point in your career, um, you're building upon already, you already have an undergraduate degree, you're building upon that. Uh, in this in this part of our program here, most of our folks in the, many of our folks in the online program are working full time. So you're already building upon that rich experience uh, that you have um, as an employee in industry. Um, and so the, this program, you need to think about it in terms of the value that it's giving you. So we've tried to make it flexible to add as much value. Those core courses, uh, I will tell you that I think all four of those core courses are gonna add value. There, there are courses that um, as you take them, when I was in graduate school working full time, um, it wasn't online, it had to come on campus. I wish there, I wish there was online at that time when I was going to school. But um, I was being able to apply some of the things I was learning in the classroom the next day. I mean, it was that, that transition and application of knowledge was that fast. And I think that's why employers like that when you, know, you have a, a, a very dedicated student. Plus the other thing that it gives you and again, you, you, ha it's, you have to be motivated to go through any graduate program. You have to really want it. The masters in this program here, uh, from an industry perspective, is gonna open up doors for you. There's no question about that. You will have other opportunities that at the after you get this diploma, you will have other opportunities that you didn't have before you started. And, and I would suspect that even while you're in the program, you'll have additional, additional doors 
opportunities will come up for you, allowing you to practice the way you want to practice as a data analytics engineer. I do not discourage people. So you come in here and let's say you have a, a, a degree in biology. I do not discourage you from, from throwing all your knowledge away from that you learned with your bachelor of science or bachelor of arts in, in biology. In fact, I say, continue to work in that domain, but now you have these analytic skills that you can apply to that particular domain. So we have lots of people that come in with um, um, a degree in another domain, you know, non-engineering, uh, non-computer science, uh, mathematicians, chemists, biologists, geologists. Uh, we have people that come in with ed uh, education degrees. Uh, we've had a couple of people that have come in, I think two, if I recall correctly, that had PhDs that, that wanted a degree in that, that actually were in the online program. So uh, this is a very, very uh, applicable set of skills and knowledge that we give you in this, this program. I like the way it's, gen it's a general type of program. So it's very, very broad, very, very diverse. And... Um, you know, gives you all those opportunities uh, to grow. And and as I was saying earlier, I've been in, I've been in technology for a long, long time, uh, you know, forty six years, and I have never seen it move this fast. At the same time, I have never seen all these educational tools, these abilities to learn these technologies. So, you know, being a lifelong learner, which is what I've been, which I am. It just allows me to really sort of move along with all these interesting applications that are coming up, uh, applying, you know, you know, working on problems, solutions that are coming up with problems now are totally different than what they were just two or three years ago. It's absolutely amazing to me. So I think it's an exciting time. It's going to be more exciting for you folks because you're going to be around, uh, you know, 30, 40 years and maybe even more. Um, and I think it'll provide you with a a very, very nice, um, you know, you don't, as I always say, I don't work for a living. Uh, I learn, I learn, you know, there's, there's a small part of my job where I do have to work like here, uh, you know, I have to help set up courses and things like that. But, but even setting up courses is, is interesting. It's motivational. I learn a lot when I do that. Uh, maybe some of the drudgery time cards and things like that, but maybe those agents I was talking about are going to help me out. Yeah. So, um, those are my final words. I, I, I strongly encourage you, you know, if you're, if what you heard tonight was of great interest, if you, you know, again, reach out to the online program. If you want to reach out to me, feel free, free to do that as well. Uh, I'm always willing to meet with, with people. I always find it interesting and I'm, I'm willing to talk to you about the program, your career, uh, where you want to go and things like that. So thank you uh, again. Thank you very, very much for, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you this evening. Thank you so much for discussing everything with us, um, Director Baldo. If you guys have any questions, again, like he mentioned, do not hesitate to call the online admissions department. You can send us an email. You can go on the website. You can call. You can even text us if that works best for you. And we'd be more than happy to elaborate on anything that comes up if you have any questions even after we end our session tonight. Thank you so much for joining us.